Good, good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, as we all know, this is a period of a uh, transition for the United Nations. The handover from one Secretary General to another is approaching. Many assessments of our work are being written and debated. At such a time, I thought it would be good for us to go back to the beginning and hear about our origins. For the circumstances of our birth, whether of uh, circumstances of birth, whether of people, institutions, or ideas, can be quite illuminating, especially if revisited from the vantage point of age and experience. And as you will see, there is far more to the story of our organization's founding than most of us know. Our guest today is Stephen Schlesinger, the author of the Act of Creation, the founding of the United Nations. Stephen is an acclaimed historian and expert in foreign policy. In the 1990s, I'm pleased to say he was one of us serving as an advisor to Habitat. Today, he runs a World Policy Institute at the New School University here in New York. His book on the United Nations almost didn't see the light of day, not for lack of effort on his part, but because it took two years to find a publisher interested in our organization. <laughs> <laughs> That is all the more remarkable because this book takes us where no historian has fully gone before. Many books have contained chapters or passages on the San Francisco Conference. Some participants have mentioned it in their memoirs, but there has never been a comprehensive account dedicated solely to this landmark effort. The act of creation is that book filling a major gap in giving us the riveting story of our uh, own organization. We learn, for example, of the intrigue and suspicion that permeated the proceedings, an early manifestation of emerging superpower uh, Cold War confrontation. We watch a ballet of venerable diplomats and younger figures seeking to make their mark and we see how perilously close the conference came to failing. But let me not steal uh, Stephen's uh, thunder. Before giving him the floor, let me make just one more point. His book is a work of a scrupulous, masterful histor historian, but it is also written with conviction, a firm belief that despite all the flaws and limitations that were evident in San Francisco, even in San Francisco, that the United Nations remains an essential presence in our world and must be preserved and improved. So thank you, Stephen, for that support and for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to hearing about your and our act of creation. So Stephen, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Some seats up front here. Why don't you come and sit, please? I'd like to thank Secretary General Kofi Annan very much for that extremely kind introduction. I, I'm very pleased and very honored to be here today. Uh, this is really a very nice occasion to talk about where this great organization originally came from. And I will talk today about how the UN Charter came into being at the 1945 conference in San Francisco. It was there, as you may recall, if you've read my book or if you've uh, read books about the UN, that some 50 countries gathered together to draft this landmark document that set up this institution in order to guarantee the peace around the world. It is this subject about which I've written my book, Act of Creation, and frankly, at the time, I thought I would be relating a very familiar story but I soon found out, as Mr. Annan has indicated, 
in the course of my research that there had, there had been no full study of that extraordinary conclave. Somehow over time, the UN's creation had been not begun simply to be taken for granted by its membership, indeed by the world. However, as we all know, history is to civilization as memory is to the individual. We really do need to know where we have come from. The more knowledge we have about the UN's origins, the better ability we will have to improve and strengthen the organization for the future. And this was the real impetus behind my own quest to seek out what had happened in San Francisco. Now in the establishment of any large global body, there are always going to be many framers, many authors, many parents. And this was certainly true of the birthing story of the United Nations. But if there was one single individual and one single state to whom we can attribute much of this singular accomplishment, it was surely to President Franklin Roosevelt and to the United States. That is simply a reality of what happened in 1945. And as a consequence, I will be mainly telling this tale from the American viewpoint. Franklin Roosevelt indeed was the central figure in this drama. Above, above all, he was the one who drove the idea forward with his signature flair and his iron determination. As many of you may know, he began his career as the Assistant Secretary of Navy under President Woodrow Wilson. And it was there that he became a fervent supporter of Wilson's dream of establishing a League of Nations following the end of the First World War. Wilson's plan really drew on our common geopolitical heritage, starting with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, after the Thirty Years' War, and the Congress in Vienna in 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars. Along with the concept developed in the 18th century by the great philosopher Immanuel Kant in his treatise, Towards Perpetual Peace. In simplest terms, Wilson proposed a global assembly which would bring together all nations under international law in peaceable relationships. Now, as a mark of his commitment to this league, Franklin Roosevelt delivered hundreds of speeches around the United States in 1919 and 1920 in favor of the league. But he was bitterly disappointed when the league went down to defeat at the hands of the American Senate, meaning that the United States would never join the organization and dealing the league a blow from which it never fully recovered. But Roosevelt had learned very valuable lessons from the League's failure on how to avoid the pitfalls of setting up a similar type of organization in the future. It was in 1939, seven years after his accession to the presidency, that Roosevelt saw the war clouds gathering in Europe and became convinced that another world war would soon erupt. At that moment, being the quite extraordinary visionary that he was, Instead of bearing any hopes of global comedy in despair, he resurrected the idea of a global body. He instructed his State Department to start drafting a UN charter, but to do so in secret, for he feared even then rousing the wrath of American isolationists. And then during the entire five years of the Second World War, he and the State Department, with the help of members of Congress, worked out the primary principles for this organization. But Roosevelt first had to overcome the objections of his closest wartime allies, the British and the Soviet Union. Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin both told him that they preferred, instead of a centralized UN, they preferred a series of regional councils to run the world, one in Europe, one in the Americas, one in Asia, one in Africa, and so on. However, Roosevelt stuck to his concept of a single all-encompassing organization, and it was his idea that ultimately prevailed. All of the leaders, though, supported the idea of collective security, the idea of states coming together around common ideals to defend themselves against aggressors. It was Roosevelt's keen insight, though, to make further changes in the UN structure based on his unhappy experiences with the League of Nations. And eventually, he drew in both Stalin and Churchill to agree to a mix of idealism and realism 
in devising the new operational framework of the world body. Now on the idealistic side, there was now going to be a general assembly, which would be the forum for which, in which all states, no matter what their size or wealth, would have the right to speak, as well as the right to cast an equal vote with other nations, and to control the UN's budget, and to gain the UN's legal protection against meddling in their domestic affairs. The Assembly's resolutions, nonetheless, would not be binding on member states, though they would carry immense moral force. In addition, the new leader of the UN, the Secretary General, would be more than just an invisible clerk, which had been true in the days of the League. The new charter now made, the chief made him the chief administrative officer and accorded him special authority under Article 99, quote, to bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter which, in his opinion, may threaten the maintenance of peace and security, end quote. This meant, in effect, that the Secretary General could help initiate debate and, when necessary, propose courses of action, neither of which powers the League had ever granted its own administrative officer. Still, when the UN first began, curiously enough, the majority of, of outside observers thought the most powerful position at the UN would always be the presidency of the General Assembly. And indeed, the UN's first Secretary General, Trigley Lee, unsuccessfully sought that post initially, but having lost it, settled reluctantly for what he saw as the lesser job of Secretary General. <laughs> On the realist side, the UN Charter attempted to reflect the political realities of the era. The Charter granted five states, the United States, the Soviet Union, China, Great Britain, and France, permanent status on the UN's Security Council, and most importantly, the veto. And then, of course, all the signatories to the UN Charter, all the member states, were now obligated to follow any Security Council decision which represented a tr truly dramatic change from the old league, where its edicts were adhered to only on a voluntary basis. Now, the argument behind this provision of the veto was that only these five countries could supply the military troops, the equipment, and financing to undergird UN enforcement actions. But it was also a means to end the old ways that the league had conducted its business, where every nation, every nation had the veto in the League, and one rogue state could stop any action it disliked. Well, finally, Roosevelt had one other motive in mind. He wanted to assure that the American Senate would pass the Charter. And in his view, the only way he could do that was to guarantee that the U.S. have a veto in the final accord. Well, needless to say, the veto was a highly controversial decision at San Francisco, as, of course, it remains highly controversial today. Many smaller nations objected at the time to the limiting of the veto to only five states, or, in fact, to the existence of any veto at all. However, in the end, both the United States and the Soviet Union made crystal clear that they would walk out of the conference and leave the UN if they did not get the veto. Given their collective fierce obstinacy, the smaller states dropped their objections and eventually accepted the deal, believing that it was better to have an organization with the big five inside, even possessing the veto power, than to have them outside with no involvement in the UN at all. And at the very least, the big powers, by being within the UN, could at times be subject to the moral dictates of the organization. Roosevelt made three other consequential decisions at the time of the conference, which, which enabled it, it to be successful. First, he won Stalin's agreement to hold the meeting while the Second World War was going on. Now, why was that important? Roosevelt calculated that as long as the struggle in the wartime was continuing, all of the representatives coming to San Francisco would take their work more seriously. But the moment the war ended, most would return to their lands to start the reconstruction of their societies, their governments, and their economies, and basically let the UN slide away. 
So the wartime period for the conference was actually a very deliberate act on the part of Franklin Roosevelt. Second, Roosevelt made certain that the gathering focused only on signing a charter, not on a peace treaty. One of the League's principal weaknesses had been that at Versailles, at the Versailles Peace Conference, its very presence got entangled in geopolitical arguments over territorial boundaries and ethnic disputes because, of course, the Versailles Conference did deal with peace and the peace treaty. And this entanglement proved fatal for the League in the end. Finally, for the consumption of his own public, Roosevelt insisted that the American delegation going to San Francisco be bipartisan, an equal number of Republicans and Democrats. Wilson had, for his part, filled his delegation mainly with Democrats so that when the League of Nations Treaty came back to the U.S. Senate, the Republican Party felt it had no investment in its passage. Roosevelt thus enlisted, for the purposes of San Francisco, such well-known Republicans as John Foster Dulles, the man who was later Secretary of State under Dwight Eisenhower, Nelson Rockefeller, later Vice President of this country, Harold Stetson, a governor of uh, Minnesota, and Senator Arthur Vandenberg from Michigan. Their participation gave the Republicans a huge reason to enact the final San Francisco Treaty. Lastly, Roosevelt poured an immense amount of U.S. resources into hosting the gathering in San Francisco. He flew delegations from war-torn nations around the globe that had no available transportation in US, in U.S. military planes to California. He brought in Broadway theatrical craftsmen to design the glittering settings for the conference. He had draftsmen produce the logo and emblem for the UN flag and for its offices. The emblem you know of the uh, round emblem with the flattened scope of the uh, yeah, earth. Yeah. It's on the piano. It's on the piano. Is, is, <laughs> was, was in, in fact developed by these draftsmen out in San Francisco with the garlands surrounding the, uh, the earth. He, uh, the U.S. provided hotel rooms, escort personnel, food supplies, daily newspapers, even a library for the delegates. And in the, in the days just before the U.N. meeting began, Roosevelt himself began to confide in his closest associates that he hoped to be the first U.N. Secretary General. So deeply was his heart set on its creation. It was in his mind to be his greatest legacy and America's most important gift to the world, but it was his final act. For then, 13 days before the conference opened, Franklin Roosevelt died, and America faced, and the world faced a crossroads. There was now a new leader in the White House, an enigmatic and still unknown politician named Harry Truman. He was a former senator who had never attended college, had been abroad once in his life when he had fought in the First World War, and otherwise it had no serious involvement in international affairs. But this unusual man had carried, neatly folded up in his pocket, since his youth, a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson entitled Loxley Hall, which extolled the notion of achieving global peace through, quote, the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World, end quote. Truman indeed turned out to be one of the great internationalist presidents this country has ever known. His very first decision as president was to instruct that the conference go forward. Later, he wrote proudly in his memoirs of his joy in giving that official order. In retrospect, it would have seemed, an, of course, an entirely logical thing to do. But Truman, at that time, really had a choice. He could, he could well have said, at that moment, that the U.S. was not going to participate in a global body. Instead, as the most powerful country on the planet in 1945, Truman could well have decided to go down the route of supporting the so-called coalitions of the willing, a concept which today Washington is famously enamored of. But he believed that the world needed a permanent institution to guarantee the peace. Coalitions, in his view, might vanish or break up at any time, while the UN would stay on as a solid pillar of peace in stormy weather and in bright sunshine, in good days and in bad days. 
Once the conference began, Truman kept in touch with his delegation on a daily basis, and there was a need to do so, for the meeting almost collapsed at least a half dozen times in internal disputes, any of which could have proven to be the death knell for the organization. I go into greater detail in my book about these showdowns, but let me just discuss a few of them briefly. There were, first, confrontations about the admissions of certain states. Only states that had declared war against the Axis powers were originally to be admitted to the San Francisco Conference. But the Western nations had opposed Poland's admission on the grounds it was a crypto-communist state. The Soviets had raised havoc over Argentine, Argentina's admission on the grounds it was a crypto-Nazi country. However, after painful and very public struggles, both nations were finally allowed membership in the UN. There were also another very public tussle over whom should be the president of the conference. Normally, the host nation has the presidency, in this case, the United States. But the Soviet Union wanted all five veto states to share in the leadership. Again, a compromise was reached. Eventually, all five agreed to rotate the presidency. There were, of course, also, as I mentioned earlier, the angry fights over the veto between the big states and the smaller ones. But even among the veto nations themselves, there was a dispute about how broad the veto should be. The Soviets desired an absolute veto that would have blocked any discussion of, of even a crisis in the Security Council, while the West insisted on a more limited version of the veto that would not apply to that sort of discussion. Eventually, it took Truman sending Harry Hopkins to Moscow for a showdown meeting with Stalin to come to an agreement whereby the Soviets backed down on their position and the li more limited veto came into being. There were questions also about whether regional organizations should be part of the, US, uh, the UN. The Latin countries demanded recognition for their regional body, the body which later became the Organization of American States. They even threatened to leave the meeting if they could not get their way. Their threat was so acute, so alarming, that the U UN quickly took action and immediately agreed to adopt Article 51, which today permits regional bodies to be part of the uh, organization. And finally, there was a great face-off over the powers of the General Assembly, what kind of powers they should have in international crises. Now, a compromise in the final days of the San Francisco meeting was reached finally granting to the assembly more leeway to be involved in pronouncing on global conflicts. A lot of these issues that I've discussed, you will hear echoes today because m many of them have never been fully resolved. Many of them are still subject to re revisiting by the membership of this organization. On the final day of the conference, President Harry Truman delivered an impassioned speech, really one for the ages. If you have a chance to read this speech, it is a quite extraordinary address. I'm just going to read one short excerpt from his, his address as follows. Truman said, quote, the successful use of this instrument will require the united will and firm determination of the free peoples who have created it. The job will tax the moral strength and fiber of all of us. We all have to recognize, no matter how great our strength, that we must deny ourselves the license to do always as we please. No one nation, no regional group, can or should expect any special privilege which harms any other nation. If any nation would keep security for itself, it must be ready and willing to share security with all. That is the price which each nation will have to pay for world peace. Unless we are willing to pay that price, no organization for world peace can accomplish its purpose. And what a reasonable price that is, end quote. In the end, why did San Francisco succeed? I believe that in a sense, there was no other choice. The mindset of the delegates in California in the spring of 1945 was almost self-evident. The planet had just endured the two worst catastrophes ever to afflict the earth. The First World War, where some 30 million people died, and a Second World War where approximately 60 million people lost their lives. 
The delegates in San Francisco were simply not willing to accept the possibility of a third cataclysm. And this was even before they knew about the existence of the atomic bomb, which was not dropped until a few months later. So the delegates were single-minded about constructing a viable global institution that could head off further bloodshed and fundamentally save the human species from extinction. And so they signed the charter. And in the United States, just a month later, just one month later, the U.S. Senate passed the treaty by the extraordinary margin of 89 to 2. I'd like to see this treaty passed by that margin today. <laughs> now, could this, or, could, uh, could this organization be recreated today? I happen not to think so. I simply do not believe that the peoples of this, of this globe, now consisting of 192 states, could ever come to a common agreement again on principles for a body of this sort. This planet really took advantage of one astonishing moment in history, a wondrous coming together of unique circumstances to come up with this assembly. A millisecond later, a millisecond earlier, and the UN would never have happened. And so today it remains the only body of this sort that we have in our world. To paraphrase Winston Churchill's famous comment about democracy, it is the worst of all systems except for all the others. And it is now uh, up to us to preserve this institution for as long as humankind will endure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Dear friend, Stephen has agreed to take some questions or comments. Yes, Ambassador. I read your book some time ago, and I remember <coughs> the vivid passages from Canada has the, the participation of Ukraine and Belarus in San Francisco conference. So maybe briefly, just uh, your comments on that long history. And the second question is, uh, as of today, how do you look at the Security Council controversy? I mean, the reform, is there a need? And how do you assess the veto as of today? Thank you. The uh, question was about how the issue of Ukraine and Belarus uh, and whether they should have been admitted as a part of the delegations coming to San Francisco in 1945. Uh, the controversy goes back to the Dunbarton Oaks Conference, which had happened a year earlier, when the Soviet Union insisted on having 16 votes that would comprise all the different ethnic and, and uh, other divisions of the then Soviet Empire. Uh, the United States and the West opposed that on the grounds that Soviet Union would be, should be no different than the United States and Great Britain and France. They should only have one vote. The Soviets quite rightly pointed out, though, that the British had a commonwealth and that could consist of 12 or 13 votes. The French had their own colonies. The, Americas, the American government probably had a lot of the Latin votes. So there was a lot of discussion about how many votes each of these veto powers should have when San Francisco rolled around. In the end, uh, th at one point, Roosevelt was convinced by his aides that if the Soviet Union was going to demand 16 vo votes, the United States should have 48 votes, representing the 48 states. <laughs> Finally, he withdrew that, realizing that was starting to get embarrassing, this whole issue of numbers. And at Yalta, finally the Soviets pulled back and agreed. There was an agreement they came to, which is that they would get Belarus and Ukraine as two additional votes in, in addition to their own vote in exchange for dropping their insistence on 16. The reason given at the time was both the Belarus and Ukraine had been involved and shed so much blood during the Second World War that they deserved membership in the body. And so that became the deal that w was worked out between Roosevelt and, and uh, Stalin. However, it was a secret deal, and it only about a month or so before the San Francisco conference began, it, the deal leaked out and caused a great deal of 
controversy in the United States that the Soviets were getting two extra votes. Uh, but Roosevelt kind of waved it away and said, well, in his, this is being his realistic side of things. He said, listen, it's, it's all in the General Assembly. Those votes don't count anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the way it finally was resolved. Uh, but um, anyway, that's a whole other issue. Uh, on the question of the veto power, I think um, this is an issue that is revisited periodically in, in, in the uh, UN, and I think it deserves to be revisited. Clearly, the argument is that in 1945, the power structure of the globe at that time was very much different than the power structure today. And therefore, to, make, to give the UN Security Council more legitimacy, it would be very important to re reflect the changes in distribution of power that are affecting, that, that are now occurring in our current time more fairly on, on the Security Council itself. The problem, of course, is how do you come to a compromise? How do you get an agreement which expands the Security Council and brings in more permanent members? And I can see from what happened in the reform movement last year that it's a very difficult issue which is going to take a long time to resolve, but I don't think it's going to be dropped. I think this is one of these issues that's going to be very recurrent and very much in the mindset of most of the delegates in, in, in the UN and may eventually put enough pressure on the five veto countries currently on the Security Council to, to finally create the conditions for change. Yes, the gentleman at the end. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, I wanted to know how China came on board as a, a, a veto power because China was not a, a, a great power by 1945, but it was a potential power. But how did they come? The question is how did China come into uh, being one of the five veto powers, one of the considered the five big powers? That's a very interesting question because the same argument, he makes the point that China was pretty much of a war-torn nation at that time. A civil war was raging in, in, in uh in the mainland. The same thing could have been said about France, which was also just recovering from the destruction of the Second World War. Each had a mentor that wanted to bring it on. In the case of China, Roosevelt wanted to have the, the China on the, on the Security Council because it had the largest population in the world. It was the, he wanted to have an Asian representative on the Security Council. And he figured that over the long run, China would redeem itself and become a great power. Um, on the issue of France, Great Britain, Churchill wanted France on, on the um, Security Council because he felt that he wanted to have more of a European representation uh, 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 in a way of counteracting the, the Soviet presence. And so France became the other power that really didn't fit the profile of a great power at that time that was led on to the Security Council. However, France and China were latecomers to the, to the banquet because really it was Soviet Union, uh, the United States, and uh, Great Britain that were making all the decisions that were leading up to the UN. It's those three countries that were fundamentally driving the whole business of what was going to happen in San Francisco. Yes, the lady at the back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for bringing uh, Mr. Schlesinger and making this lecture possible. Uh, what do you see in the future? What do I see in the future about the UN? Yes. I, I, I <laughs> you know, as, as the Secretary General well knows, and I've certainly seen it in my studies, the, um, the rumors of the UN's demise are uh, highly exaggerated. I can't tell you how many times I've been told that the UN is irrelevant, it's not going to make any difference, that might as well pack up everybody's bags and go home. And then a crisis comes along, and where does everybody go? They go to the UN. I look at what happened in Lebanon. You know, uh, th there was no way of getting out of that crisis. Lebanon and, the, and, and, and Israel would have continued that war with no side winning, and there would have been no way of breaking the, the vicious cycle of warfare had it not been for this organization and for Kofi Annan. And the fact is that there will be lull times when this organization does seem to be very quiescent, uh, 
doesn't seem to be doing great things, and that's because there are no direct uh, threats to the world community that have to be resolved. doesn't mean that many of the other agencies of the UN are not doing their work and feeding the hungry and trying to eliminate disease. But if you took the UN today away, what would you have? You, who would be responsible for the 19 peacekeeping missions that are going on right now? Who would be trying to resolve crises that uh, otherwise might sp spiral out of control? There is no other organization that plays this very distinct and unique role. And so I think even the Bush administration has come around to finding that the UN is a useful uh, uh, vehicle for trying to achieve ends that uh, otherwise it could not achieve. So my feeling is very positive about the UN. I think it has a role to play. I think it takes on more and more responsibility. The Peacekeeping Commission, the Democracy Fund, the New Human Rights Council, it, 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 rather than shrinking in size or in, in uh, proportions, it's actually grown in, in, in both influence and, and, and authority. And I think that's going to continue because crises are never going to go away. Yes, the gentleman in this sweater. Well, thanks again to the Secretary General, and I hope that this is not the last time we have uh, another uh, academic uh, event uh, before you uh, depart, obviously. Uh, Professor Schlesinger, my question regards the, the depiction of the media in your book um, as opposed to the media today. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I, I remember that you were talking about the sense of euphoria uh, with the media back then. And also, do you see individuals within the current uh, government in the U.S. that have the same potential, such as individuals you mentioned in the book, like Leo Polvosky or Rolf Bunch or Vandenberg, Rockefeller, etc.? Well, I think the U.N. remains, uh, the question is about the U.N.'s uh, role with the media, media being quite enthusiastic back in 1945, and the U.S. attitude towards the U.N. today, whether there are any enthusiasts in the American society for, for this organization in our current time. Um, it is true that the media got, got swept up, as everybody did at that time, in the enthusiasm for, for the UN, um, which is, in a sense, reflective of a very legitimate sentiment of that time, the, the desire that warfare could not be allowed to continue. There had to be some kind of body that would short-circuit um, crises before they uh, spun out of control. Uh, I think the media today, it depends, of course, which media you're talking about, but ha does not always report accurately about how this organization uh, operates. We do have some very distinguished journalists who do cover the UN for much, much of the media around the world. Uh, I happen to think that I the representation of my own country in terms of, of coverage has, is not as great and is not as sophisticated as I would like. Uh, too often what happens in my own country is that the bad instances of, of where the UN is failing or the UN does not happen to be able to handle a particular crisis comes becomes the headline as opposed to those times when the UN actually produces a legitimate solution. Uh, even with the issue of the settlement of the Lebanon-Israel uh, ceasefire, the credit really should have been given, in my view, far greater coverage to the United Nations. Once the ceasefire was put in effect, the people went on to other issues and it was kind of forgotten. Um, so I, I would fault my own media for not doing as great a job as they could, although there are certainly individuals who I could single out who have done uh, very valuable, played a very valuable role in conveying the way this organization actually operates. As for the UN and whether there are American enthusiasts, yes, there are. There are a lot of American enthusiasts. There's represented by the UN Association of the United States, represented by individuals in, in Congress, despite what you read about Congress, there are a lot of Democrats and Republicans who are very supportive of this organization. The problem is that many of them fear 
to go public with it because they think it's not going to get them any votes. The UN, despite the fact that it has a 60 to 70 percent favorable rating among Americans, does not seem to convey with the same esprit the sense that it, it's a vote gathering vehicle for, for people running for election. I, I find that a little problematical and, and um, not understandable, but that apparently is the mindset of most people running for office these days. They'd rather run against the UN rather than for it. And I always find that so ironic since when you look back, it was this American government which created this organization. My feel is Americans should be proud of it. It was one of the great things we ever did for this wonderful and also very conflicted world. And we should be honored to be part of it and feel that it, it, it actually enhances our national security interests rather than diminishes them. So yes, there are enthusiasts. They're not getting the voice or play that they should, but someday I feel that, they, that their voices will start being far more reflective of, of the general sentiment in this country in favor of the organization. Lady at the back. Thank you, Secretary General, for this lecture and for all that you've organized, and Professor Schlesinger. I read with great interest your book when I began my work here as an NGO representative, more so because I'm a daughter of San Francisco, and I learned that the first Russian and English edition of the Charter were printed on my grandfather's printing press. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been part of the lure of my family for a long time. But I was fascinated in your book how you recounted how FDR saw the importance of engaging civil society in the development leading up to the UN. May I ask you to say a few more words about that, please? Thank you. One of Roosevelt's great innovations was to permit the participation of NGOs uh, in the proceedings in San Francisco. Uh, he realized that if he was going to win the support of the broad cross-section of the American people for this treaty. Remember, 20, 25 years earlier, the League of Nations Treaty had been defeated by the U.S. Senate. So he was very conscious of spreading as much attention to as many different constituencies in the United States uh, in order to get that groundswell of support to make sure that the Senate would ratify the U.N. Treaty. So in order to do that, he allowed about 42 NGOs to come out to San Francisco and be official parts, uh, be official representatives in the actual deliberations that went on with the U.S. mission. And in fact, the U.S. mission did meet almost on a daily basis with these, with the leaders of these different organizations. And as a result of that, and, and also there were other, other countries brought along NGOs. The United States was not the only one to do this. But as a result of the, of the participation of the NGOs in San Francisco, it became enshrined in an article in the UN Charter that allows UN, uh, N NGOs to participate in the work of ECOSOC. Uh, and, and, and that has been a very much of an established pattern ever since. And I know under Secret the Secretary General Kofi Annan, this has been broadened even more to business and to well, lots of different other constituencies which have not had prior representation in the organization. It can only strengthen the UN to have as many different routes and, and participants uh, to make this body legitimate in the eyes of the world. So this was a very important part of what happened in San Francisco. Thank you. Yes. You spoke of the sponsorship of uh, France and uh, China. Roosevelt also sponsored another country, Brazil. Why did you have to relent on that eventually? Yes, uh, this is true. During the deliberations about who should be on the, the who should be the members of the permanent five at that time, there was gonna there was a thought at one time there'd be a permanent six, and that would have been Brazil. And Roosevelt was pushing this very hard because he felt there should be some represented re representation for Latin America. But in the end, he became convinced by his advisors and by the reaction of the other uh, leaders uh, of the big five, that Brazil was, did not constitute what he regarded as a world power at that time, and that 
despite the fact that Brazil had actually fought in the Second World War, it did not rise to the level of great power age, whatever that really is defined as, since clearly France and China didn't exactly fit the profile either. So Brazil, unfortunately, bit the dust and, and never made the final, final five. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for the chance to ask a question. And I'm sure you know what I'm going to ask about. Now, uh, world wars, Lebanon, are problems started by men that can be ended by men. But some problems are started by men but are taken out from his hands. And I mean things like global warming, certain genetic changes, uh, new microbes, and things like that. Do you see the possibility for this world body actually to become more than an alliance of nations and actually become a superstructure that can actually try to tell us what to do in order to save ourselves from ourselves? Well, I think the question really boils down to whether you can see this as a kind of world government. I, I don't see it right now. Uh, in fact, I don't see it for quite a long time because I think that there are, the nations who are members, member states of the United Nations are very jealous of their prerogatives as, as individual states and do not want to give up the notion that they should be, there should be some supranational, international body that would dictate how they operate uh, as countries. However, we have seen the, the first uh, fledgling um, type organizations that are doing that very same thing, except on a regional basis. European Union is a good example, or uh, the African Union, or the Organization for American States, all attempts to provide sort of rules and regulations on how those countries operate within their regional framework. So yes, there is certainly precedent for that developing on an international stage. Um, and certainly, right now, the United Nations does have a relationship with the parliaments of the world. I think they meet two or three weeks before every conference in the fall, before the General Assembly meets. So there, there is a kind of interaction that goes on all the time in that sense. Um, but I, I don't think that uh, it will ever reach, at least in my, is while I'm alive, the point where you're going to have elected representatives to a world body representing, in effect, a world government. And in any, in any case, in order to make that change, you would have to get the agreement of the five veto states. Because they, as you know, under the charter, they can block any amendment to the charter that, that occurs. And if, I, I sort of think they like things the way it is right now. <laughs> so I don't th see them really jumping to this idea very, very uh, enthusiastically. Thank you both very much. Um, my question is actually when you were talking about um, with the improvement upon the League of Nations um, from the role of the, the leader as sort of the powerless clerk um, and how um, with the United Nations how we've, we've gone so far to improve that. Um, and I think uh, the Secretary General has done an extremely commendable job um, in further expanding that role. Um, and I, my question for you is um, exactly um, what sort of things at the beginning of the foundation of the organization were done explicitly to improve, expand the role, and then also if you could point to sort of predecessors of the Secretary General that um, further expanded and, and did move things in that direction to give the Secretary General more power? So. Well, the question is about how the Secretary General's power, uh, written into the original charter, but not really sort of fully formed gradually developed over the years. There was one final famous occasion when Trigley Lee, then Secretary General, um, wanted to bring an issue to the attention of the Security Council. And the Security Council tried to turn on him and prevent him from doing so. And he insisted that he be, do, be allowed to do so. And finally, whatever membership, whatever the members who didn't want him there sort of backed down that kind of constituted a real shift in, in uh, power in terms of where the Secretary General role would be. Uh, because 
until then, it was not still very clear how much real authority a secretary general would have. People were still remembering what had happened under the League auspices. Uh, and then over the years, it became clear that uh, as these crises uh, evolve, uh, you couldn't, particularly if it was two countries, one on one side of the dispute and one on the other, you had to have a kind of neutral arbiter, somebody who had good offices that could offer a place to work out a, uh, some sort of settlement. And it became increasingly clear that the Secretary General was the person that, to whom people could turn, particularly when you had the old Cold War period between communists on one side and, and the democracies on the other. So the role grew greater, and, and, and over the years, as these crises ebbed and flowed, um, the Secretary General's role, I think, it would be fair to say, ebbed and flowed with him, but his, his, his ability to offer the good offices of, of, of the Secretariat only, only was, were augmented as, as, as the decades passed. Um, I'm sure this, the Secretary General could talk more fluently and eloquently about this than myself, but I think that's sort of pretty much the way it developed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep pushing the emblems. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, would you briefly comment on the advantage or disadvantage of having Asian or Korean Secretary General for this uh, white organization? Ah. <laughs> the question is the advantages or disadvantages of having a South Korean as a new Secretary General. Well, I, I can think of one immense advantage right now, which is that the uh, North Koreans have uh, just exploded at an atomic bomb and cl clearly somebody who has knowledge of the North Koreans comes in with a special expertise that would be very useful in, in, in dealing with this crisis as it unfolds. But it did also seem legitimate that an Asian should be the next Secretary General. I mean, there's been a kind of informal arrangement or agreement among the membership of this body that there be a shift, a rotation of the Secretary General between geographical regions, and Asia did have the next uh, slot on that uh, rotation. So uh, from that point of view, it also is uh, a good thing that the, the South Korean got, got, got the position. Um, and m more importantly, that uh, South Korea was not vetoed by any of the five veto countries, because if you're vetoed, you've you got no, no business being on the Security Council or uh, Secretary General at all. You have to have support of those five countries if you want to be an effective leader of this organization. Take a couple of, to the back. Oh, there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for this lecture today and, in fact, the entire series. That's been very interesting. Professor, uh, given that this might be called a, a, a child of President Roosevelt is nearing the prime of its middle age, if 60 is the new 50, <laughs> can we gain any insight from history and writings at the time as to what President Roosevelt might think of the organization as it has developed, and whether there's any insight into how the organization might consider reforming itself, assuming that the structure and management practices have evolved a great deal from what was in place in those heady early days. From my reading of Ralph Bunch, it seemed that there was very much a can-do feeling that anything was possible and there was probably much less formality than necessarily adheres to this mature organization today. Thank you. Okay, the question about whether Franklin Roosevelt, what he would think about the UN today. I think Fra Franklin Roosevelt would be applauding what's happening in the UN today. Um, I think he would have looked at the Secretary General's reform package of last year as a very much in the tradition and, and, and in the great his historical tradition of, of what the UN is all about because he would have seen that package of reforms as necessary to make the organization 
re relevant and contemporary for what is going on in a very conflicted world we face today. Uh, he would have been very pleased, I think, for the setting up of the Peacekeeping Commission, of the Democracy Fund, of the Human Rights Council. Uh, all of those were, were tokens of, of what he regarded were, were crucial to the uh, f give full meaning to the UN Charter. Um, I think he would have been quite discouraged, frankly, by the attitude of the current administration in Washington towards the UN, a kind of mix of indifference and involvement and then more indifference and more involvement and then more indifference. I think he would have felt that America's destiny li 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 lay with, with working with this organization and that sustained involvement would be not only helpful to the UN but also to the national goals of, of this country. And I think finally he would have been very uh, supportive of the 10-year term of Kofi Annan. I think he would have felt Kofi Annan very much fit the profile of what he regarded as the single most important qualification for being a Secretary General. That, that is to be a moral leader. And I think that he would have been very pleased with, with Mr. Annan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. One last question and then we break. Okay, we take two. One there and one there. We take um, both of them together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I'm grateful to you for this uh, series of lectures and I'm happy to uh, see you and I hope I will meet you before you leave. <laughs> Um, the professor, on account of uh, your erudition and thorough knowledge of the topic at hand, I don't regret missing uh, my lunch in Ramadan. Um, back to the topic of uh, veto. Um, you said that the League of Nations, every nation had a veto and a rogue nation could use it left and right. Um, in addition to what you have just mentioned about reform of the veto system, I wonder whether you have specific ideas to curb the excessive use of veto because right now there is no limit to use the veto. Any nation can use any of the fives, can use the veto roguely um, enough to disrupt and corrupt any process or any decision. Um, we have all nations enjoying the veto power in the fifth committee. Uh, do you have specific ideas to lure those five members to budge a little bit, especially when we have the rules of procedure still provisional in the council after the lapse of uh, 61 years? Thank you. And then we take the last one. One, one more question then, and then that will be the last one. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. And um, <clears throat> my question was in regards to uh, the drafters of the UN Charter, uh, perhaps maybe whether they envisioned the Charter to uh, be more like a, a living document which could adapt to the, the realities of the world, similar to a national constitution, or whether it would be something to embed the realities of uh, what was going on or the power relations of 1945. Thank you. On the first question, um, the ind indiscriminate use of the veto by the five powers. Uh, yes, you know, the veto is, is a quite extraordinary weapon. I mean, when you look at the Charter, you pretty much can, except for blocking discussion on the Security Council, you can, you, where you're not allowed to use the veto, you can pretty much do a lot of damage to this organization if you wanted to. Uh, or you can certainly prevent a lot of things from happening. Um, I think the discussion of the veto uh, will not end and certainly has not ended just because the reforms didn't work out last year. Uh, there's already been um, some discussion about having semi-permanent semi membership, ten-year membership. Some of the reforms that came out that were proposed by Kofi Annan's high-level reform commission uh, 
go along those lines. And they certainly are still under discussion. And they could be a kind of um, bridge uh, of a kind of short-term variety leading to basic changes in the veto f much further down the line. So I wouldn't rule out the fact that you might have some movement in terms of surely adding on four or five additional two-year rotating positions, but at the same time five or six semi-permit positions which would last for 10 years and then there'd be elections for the next round of semi-permanent memberships. And uh, that could be a way of gradually changing the structure of the Security Council to make it more reflective of the actual distribution of power around the world uh, today. On the other issue, the how the UN Charter was put together, I think it was done deliberately in very general, in, in very general type terms because I think the founders realized that like any constitution, it was going to have to adjust to the exigencies of every new age and that every new decade required, made different demands on the, on the body. And therefore, if you look at what the Charter says and what the UN has actually done, just for example from the point of view of the Security Council, there have been many uh, undertakings that the Security Council has endorsed that are not even mentioned in the, in, in the original Charter. Peacekeeping, nation building, training of military troops, uh, the use of uh, constitutional right, constitution writing. Uh, all, all, the, the list actually is quite endless. All of these are concepts that were never originally part of the UN Charter, but have developed out of the needs of the community, the world community, at any particular time over the last 61 years. And that is the great strength of this Charter, that it is flexible, that it is elastic, that it can respond to the needs of every new generation. And it's one of the reasons why, unlike the League of Nations, the UN Charter is still very much relevant and very much a, a strong institutional document, even 61 years after its founding in, in San Francisco in 1945. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. I think uh, you would all agree with me that it's given us a lot uh, to chew on, and it's wonderful to come back periodically to sit and look back to where you've come from and looking at the art of creation, the ideas of the founders and what they have set out to achieve and for us to look at it in terms of where we are and if we've lived up to the expectations and to the ideals. And again, to discover that some of the very debates that were taking place at the time of the founding of the organization are still going on now. We take, for example, the discussions of the veto, whether a uh, veto can be justified and whether it should be limited to five, whether it should be taken away from them or additional vetoes be created. The role of the General Assembly and the Security Council, this debate is still going on. And, and some of them, some of these issues will be with us for a long time. But I think what is important and what Professor Schlesinger's discussions have brought home to us is that um, we live in a dynamic world and in a dynamic society. And as an organization, we need to adapt. And we have proven that over the years, we have been able to adapt, interpreting the charter, bringing in new areas, expanding into new areas to cope with the realities of the day. And as we move forward as an organization, this challenge is going to be even greater because we are going to be facing a whole slew of challenges which our founders could not have anticipated, and yet we have to deal with it. So we have to be creative and imaginative enough uh, to be able to tackle them and still re restrain, uh, remain within our, our charter. Uh, so I think we, you will join me after two years of discussion about reform, transforming the UN, in thanking Professor Schlesinger for joining us this afternoon to take us back to the beginning. And really it's important to have a sense of history because without a sense of history, you cannot have a sense of vision. So let's thank Professor Schlesinger for his time. Thank you.